Well, thank you all very much for that warm welcome, and thanks for the very kind introduction once again, Tom. It's wonderful to be back at the 92nd Street Y. A real privilege to be able to interview you, David, tonight on this great stage, which, as you know, regularly achieves the greatest intellectual critical mass in all of the world's greatest city. Uh, up front, I want to assure you as your interrogator tonight that I will, use, <laughs> I will not use enhanced interrogation techniques. Uh, as many in the audience have heard me state in the past, I've always opposed such techniques for two reasons. First, they're against international law, and second, they generally don't work. Um, look, I think most people in the audience are here this evening to find out how an only child of Jewish parents who didn't finish high school, your dad was a postal worker, your mom was a homemaker, who grew up in Baltimore in what you have described as one of the few enclaves where Jewish people could buy houses in those days, could go on to graduate magna cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa from Duke, get a law degree at the University of Chicago where you were editor of the Law Review, uh, serve as deputy, ultimately get into politics after practicing law, deputy assistant to President Carter for domestic policy, three years out of law school. You then returned to the practice of law and within a few years founded the private equity firm, the Carlisle Group. And defying conventional wisdom and locating it in Washington, D.C. rather than New York, and then overseeing its growth to be one of the great global investment firms uh, in the world uh, with some 170 billion under management. And then become, as you heard, one of America's great philanthropists, uh, and again, chairman of the boards of the Kennedy Center, the Smithsonian Institution, the Council on Foreign Relations. Now that is a nonprofit hat trick. Uh, and then become a TV star and one of the great interviewers on air with your own show, one of Bloomberg's fastest growing shows, and with adoring press pieces such as this one, which I just happened to see in the Washingtonian, David Rubenstein, superstar. So tonight, <laughs> we, we hope to learn how, uh, as a wonderful additional Washingtonian piece asked, how did a socially awkward 68-year-old private equity titan who had lobs genial questions at fellow A-listers become a cable TV standout? So let's start at the beginning, David. Tell us about your upbringing, please, your parents, and hey. your education. Well, first let me say I'm honored to be here. And I'm honored to be interviewed by you. Um, it obviously should be me interviewing you. Um, you're far more accomplished than I am. Um, so I'm humbled to be interviewed by you. And I did interview you for my TV show. And it was uh, very well received. And at the time, you said you'd like to interview me. I was amazed that you would want to interview me. But I'm happy to be here. Um, so um, how did I, I didn't lower your expectations. I'm not nearly as good as these introductions. Uh, and as, after you hear me, you'll probably agree that I am not as good as you've heard. Um, I, I grew up in a very modest uh, means. Um, my father dropped out of high school uh, to go into World War II. Um, he came back, met my mother. Um, she dropped out of high school to marry him. She was 17. He was 20. I was born more than nine months later. Um, <laughs> and my father had no uh, the ability to really get a, a professional job, and he didn't have the ambition perhaps to do so. So he worked in the post office his entire life, uh, made seven or eight thousand dollars a year. And in hindsight, it was a great advantage to me because my children have grown up in a reasonably wealthy family. Um, if you have a wealthy father or mother, um, you have some disadvantages. People might laugh at it, but anything you achieve, people say, well, your father made it possible, your mother made that possible. In my case, um, when I was growing up, I thought I had some real disadvantages because I didn't have a wealthy family, and I had friends who were far wealthier, but it was a great advantage. The greatest thing you can have growing up is the unconditional love of two parents. If you have that, you don't need any financial access or other uh, accoutrements of wealth. So my parents, uh, as the only child, adored me. Um, obviously, they, I didn't deserve to be adored, but they, I was the only thing they had. And, <laughs> and, and so I, I, I worked hard, and I, you know, recognized that I didn't have, I wasn't particularly handsome, I wasn't a great athlete, I wasn't overly smart, I didn't have a great personality, but I, you know, worked hard, and I tried to make up for all that. In the place I grew up in Baltimore, it was the most rigidly segregated place in the United States by religion, because the Jews were not allowed to buy homes. The mortgages in this country, as you probably all know, there were restrictive covenants. And the restrictive covenant said you can't sell a home to somebody who's Jewish or typically somebody's black. 
Um, that was outlawed by the United States Supreme Court in Shelley v. Kramer in 1948, but they didn't get the word in Baltimore. So they still had these <laughs> restrictive covenants and people weren't honoring them. So uh, the Jews couldn't buy homes any place, so they had to build their own homes. And there was a Jewish enclave and we all had tiny little row homes, at least uh, uh, the, the, the blue collar Jews had these tiny homes. The home that I grew up in, it was 800 square feet. So it had one bathroom, it was 800 square feet, that was it. I didn't know anything else. So I, you know, I just, I got lucky and got, uh, did okay in high school and got some scholarships. I got a scholarship to go to Duke University, not a basketball scholarship, I assure you. Um, <laughs> and um, then I got a scholarship to go to University of Chicago Law School. And I'll tell you, I had so little money in those days that when I got a full scholarship to go to the University of Chicago Law School, I was, you know, elated because my parents didn't have to pay for it and I could um, get a good education. But they said, send in the $50 to reserve your place in the law school, okay? Then they said, send, the next, send another $50 the next day. They sent me another letter to reserve your place in the law school dorm. Well, I said, well, I don't have an extra $50 hanging around, so I'll send in the $50 for the, for the dorm. Surely the dorm people will tell the law school I'm coming, because why would I need a dorm room if I'm not going to be going to law school? That logic didn't work. Um, <laughs> So I showed up the first day in law school and said, here I am, David Rubenstein, full scholarship recipient. They said, well, you didn't send your $50. That money went somewhere else. So I started to cry and said, uh-oh, my legal career is over. There's no scholarship. Um, finally, they, they didn't want somebody crying in the admissions office, so they came back and they gave me the money. And I've now given them $35 million in scholarship money to make up for it. So uh, it was a good investment for that's them. That's what's called a good return right, on right. investment. They yeah. did well. Um, nice but, ROI. So anyway, um, I grew up in a, a, a very modest uh, means uh, and place, and um, I you know, went to public high school and, and, uh, and, and did okay at Duke and okay at University of Chicago Law School. And I mean, then Phi Beta Kappa is a little bit more than okay. Uh, it was okay, but, I, but I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't a Rhodes Scholar and I wasn't a Supreme Court clerk, so I was okay. <laughs> I, I did the most I could with what I had. In other words, I, I did, you know, uh, there are sometimes people, and you were no doubt one of them, who everybody looks up to, you know, big men on campus. Um, and I wasn't a big man on campus. I was a very, very small person on campus. And you know, sometimes wonder what happens to these people. So there was somebody I worked with in government. I won't identify the person uh, much, but the person had the kind of resume I wish I'd had. Harvard College, summa cum laude. Rhodes Scholar, Yale Law School, Editor-in-Chief of Law Journal, Supreme Court Clerk, PhD from Berkeley in economics as well. Everything you want. So, and I was handsome and charming, blonde, blue-eyed, everything you know, somebody Jewish wants, right? <laughs> so I, I just envious of this person. And, and because he had such a great resume, he didn't really have to work very hard because every time uh, somebody would see the resume, they would give him another job. And he didn't actually have to prove himself in any job. So at the time he got to 50, he hadn't actually accomplished anything. He'd have like 30 different jobs because everybody was always promoting him. So the disadvantage of, of, of that is that you don't have to work that hard to prove yourself. In my case, I always was trying to you know, work harder and prove myself because I had so much more to prove and I was always you know, trying to get to the top. You, were, you had it much easier because you were the star at West Point and everything else, and I, I, I didn't have that. Well, I was the son of a... A Dutch American well, sea captain well, with a, okay, a okay. mother who was a librarian and All right, we but, loved reading. By the way, your parents, I assume, ignited your love of books? Yes. Um, I, we couldn't afford to buy books, so um, in Baltimore, you could, have, you could get a library card at six years old. So we, you know, we didn't have a car when I was growing up or for part of it. And so my mother would walk me to the library and I'd get my card at six years old and uh, you could take out 12 books a week. So I'd take them out and I'd read them all the same day and then I had to wait another week before I get 12 more books. So I, I, I love books and I'm passionate about the importance of it. I try to read two books a week. Um, I have underwritten the National Book Festival. I've underwritten the literacy uh, prizes at the Library of Congress. I'm the chairman of the Library of Congress Madison Council. And I just think that we need to get people to appreciate the importance of books. I worry that people aren't reading books and it's hard to believe this, 14% uh, of the people in the United States who are adults are functionally illiterate. That means they can't read past the fourth grade level, 14%. But even more amazing is 30% of people who graduate from college never read another book in their, in, their, in their life. Never read another book in their life. They figure they got their degree, that's it. And so I think books are a, a wonderful thing and it's, it's a great part of my life to try to read uh, two books a week. Couldn't agree with you more. So after Chicago Law School, you head to a law firm in New York uh, and you seek out Ted Sorensen. Yes, let me explain. When I was in the sixth grade, John Kennedy gave his famous uh, inaugural address. I think the greatest inaugural address of the 20th century. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what, what you can do for your country. 
That was a brilliant speech. It was 14 minutes. It was the greatest speech John Kennedy ever gave, and I, I think no president probably has given a better inaugural address, maybe since Lincoln's second inaugural. Um, I was inspired by that, and my teacher in the sixth grade went through that word for word with us in my class, and it was really poetry in prose form. And I just really wanted to serve my country, and no doubt many people in my generation uh, wanted to do that. So when I, when I had a chance to practice law, I wanted to go to the firm in New York that um, uh, Ted Sorensen was at. And it was a firm that was an unusual New York firm because in those days, New York law firms were either Jewish or non-Jewish. And Paul Weiss was unique because it was Jewish and non-Jewish. had Jews and non-Jews. That was relatively unique. And Ted Sorensen was not Jewish. Um, he uh, had, actually his mother was Jewish, but his father wasn't. And he grew up in Nebraska. He worked for John Kennedy, was his intellectual blood bank. When John Kennedy was assassinated, he then wrote a book called Kennedy, which was a terrific book about uh, his life with Kennedy. And then he went to practice law. And I went there and figured it would rub off on me. And very quickly, it became apparent I wasn't that good a lawyer. And my clients would tell me that. And it was very <laughs> clear that, that my colleagues realized I wasn't that good, so they would tell me that. So I realized I should get out of the practice of law. And that was a great advantage, because if I was a reasonably good lawyer, I would have stayed and you know, worked my way up to be a partner, and I would probably not have done other things. So by not being a good lawyer, uh, it, it enabled me to do other things. But Ted Sorensen wanted to get me out of the firm, I think. And to get me out of the firm, he got me a job in Washington, DC. At the Senate Judiciary Committee. He got me a job as the chief counsel for the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Constitutional Amendments, whose main job was to not have any constitutional amendments. So we weren't really <laughs> supposed to do anything. But he was really, the, the chairman of the committee was Birch Bayh, and he was running for president. The whole point of it was I was going to go work for Birch Bayh. He was going to be president of the United States. Ted Sorensen said, you'll get to work in the White House, just as I did. Uh, 30 days after I joined Birch Bayh's um, Senate staff, he dropped out. So I said, and this may have happened to people like in this audience, I was not a great lawyer, and I realized that legal career wasn't going anywhere. I went into politics, you could say, to go work in the campaign, uh, and, and the Senate staff, but it was really helping, hope hopefully going to work in the White House. And 30 days after I did that, I was you know, basically with a person who wasn't going to be president. So then I got a call out of the blue, as many of you may have, where somebody said, would you like to interview for somebody else who's running for president of the United States? I said, well, I don't really have anything else to do. Who was the person? Jimmy Carter. I said, isn't that the peanut farmer from Georgia? <laughs> and they said, yes. I said, look, let me tell you something. He's not going to be president of the United States. There's no way we're going to like the peanut farmer from Georgia. But I didn't have anything else to do. I got the interview. I got the job. I went down to Georgia. And when I went down, Carter was 33 points ahead of Gerald Ford. And when I finished, Carter won by one point. So Carter often said, like, what was your contribution here? Like, you know, I was doing much better before you carpetbaggers came down. But as we have seen in every administration that I'm familiar with, the White House staff is filled with people who work in the campaign and not on the merit necessarily. So I got a job in the White House staff when I was 27 years old. The deputy domestic policy right. advisor to the president of the United States. And by the way, I've heard you note that neither you nor the new president were qualified for your positions. <laughs> well, um, yes, I wasn't qualified for sure. And I didn't think Carter was particularly qualified. But by today's standards, he was extraordinarily qualified. Um, <laughs> you know, he'd been governor of Georgia for four years. I mean, that, may, that's, that was today. That would be a lot. Uh, then it uh, doesn't seem that much. But Carter had a brilliant idea. And he actually reinvented one aspect of the presidency. Um, it historically had been thought that you had to have been a cabinet officer, a vice president, a senator for a long time, or maybe governor for a long time. But Carter had the idea that having met him, many people were thinking of running for president in 1976, and he didn't think they were smarter than he, and he finished his term as governor as 1974. He was elected in 70, finished in 74. He had two years with nothing to do. So he and basically moved to Iowa. And he basically realized that if he could win Iowa with modest resources, that would propel him to New Hampshire. If he win New Hampshire with modest resources, he'd be off to the races. And ever since then, that is essentially what's happened. So Carter kind of invented that idea. And, and actually, he didn't even win Iowa. He came in second to un, undecided, but, he, but second was, uh, was enough. So you did this for four years. Any big takeaways from that experience, David? There's nothing quite like uh, serving your country. Uh, now, serving your country in the military is a different level. Because when you're serving your country in the military, um, you are, you're, you're, you're at risk of losing your life. Um, and, and, and therefore, you're going to make uh, what Lincoln called um, you know, um, the, 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 you know, the most full measure, the last full measure of devotion. Um, and that's at a different level. But when you are working in the White House, you do feel that you are serving your country in some way. And I wanted to serve my country. So one, it's a, it's a great honor to do it. Two, I recognize that 
you can call anybody in the, in the world and get them to take that call. So if you're, <laughs> somebody is calling, if you're calling from the White House, you know, the, the secretary might say, oh, he's in the bathroom. Oh, that's David Rubenstein from the White House. Have him call me back. And wait a second, he's coming out of the bathroom. So, um, and even a better trick than that is calling from Air Force One. If you call somebody from Air Force One, they will come out of surgery to take your call. Um, so so I, I realize it's a great honor to work there. You can get people to do a lot of things. Uh, you can see the whole world coming through the White House. In other words, if you hang out in the White House for a, a month, you sit in the, in, in, in the uh, reception room, you'll see the entire world come because everybody of any importance wants to come there to see the president or get something. So it's a, it's a great honor and it's a lot of pressure. I, at the time, I was, I was um, you know, single and I, I was just, this is what I wanted to do with my life, was work in the White House. So I didn't take a day off, literally, for, for four years. I worked around the clock. Newsweek wrote an article about me saying that the, the cleaning lady, ladies were upset that I would never leave my office. They couldn't clean my office. But I, I just loved it. I worked there seven days a week. I got to travel with Carter. And you know, think about it. You know, my parents had, were not even high school graduates. And they would come to sit, to stand on the South Lawn. They see President and me walking out of the Oval Office to go to Camp David on Marine One or something like that. And they're thinking, hey, how did this happen? And I'm kind of thinking to myself, how did it happen? It, it was incredible through. And you know it, what it's like to be in the White House. And um, it was an honor that I'll, I'll probably never have again. Because I got inflation to 19%, I'll never have the honor again because <laughs> nobody's, like, nobody's inviting me back to government. <laughs> so you then go back to, to law for a few years. And then comes the moment uh, when you realize, realize, as I yes. have, I think, that the highest calling in life outside government is, of course, the private equity industry. Oh, it is. <laughs> and, uh, and so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> clearly, a lot of private equity people in the audience here. So, so you co found the Carlisle right. Group. Um, you know, how did this happen? Uh, well, you know, you went to law school, not right. business school. You have admitted you had no business experience at the right. time. You locate the headquarters in Washington, of all places. Even I commute to New York right, from right. D.C. to do um, private equity. <laughs> well, um, a couple of things. One, um, I went back, to, when I worked in the White House, and, and if you work in the White House, any of you worked in the White House, or, it, 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 people will come to you all the time and tell you how great you are. So people will tell me, you're a bright young man. If you ever want a job, call me up. And of course, I'd say, I'm, I'm staying here for the second term of Carter. I don't, I don't want to leave. Um, and then there was no second term. We wanted to run against Ronald Reagan. Um, it, today, people will laugh at the idea that we thought we'd beat Ronald Reagan, but we figured Carter was the incumbent president of the United States, a pretty smart guy. He had gas lines, we had inflation, we had hostages, yes, but Ronald Reagan was an old, old man. He was 69 years old. Now, I'm 68. Now, 69 doesn't seem so old, but in those days, I was 31. 69 seemed like he was ready for a nursing home. So I figured, how could people vote for this guy? And there were other problems I thought he had. But we lost. And be careful what you wish for. We wanted to run for against Reagan. We ran against him. All right, so the day after the election, I then started calling all the people told me how brilliant I was, how great I was. And I said, OK, I'm now ready for that job. Well, they never called back. Because if you're out of power in Washington, you're a dead man. As Harry Truman said, if you want a, a friend in Washington, get a dog. Then nobody would call me back. So I, you know, I, it's hard to believe. I had a reasonable uh, record at the White House, and, but nobody wanted to hire a Carter White House aide. So I couldn't explain this to my mother. And I would say, well, I have so many offers, I just don't know which one to take. <laughs> and so uh, she, after January 20th, she said, David, which one are you taking? I said, I just don't know. There's six of them, seven of them. I don't know which one. I'll, and then February, March, April, May, June. She said, David, why don't you just take one of them? But I didn't have any offers. Nobody wanted me. So finally, a law firm felt sorry for me. They said, you can come here, but start at the bottom. And once again, I realized I was not a good lawyer. And the good news about learning you're not a good lawyer is that you won't stay in it. And you can't, and I didn't like it either, you can't accomplish anything great if you don't like it. Nobody won a Nobel Prize uh, in doing something they hate. So I didn't like it. I wasn't good at it. So what happened was I read two things that changed my life and got me to do this. One was I read about a man named Bill Simon, who had been Secretary of the Treasury under Gerald Ford. And he later, after Ford lost, lost the election, he went back in the private sector. He had previously been at Salomon Brothers of the Trader. He started something, a firm, to do leverage buyouts. And apparently he did one of them that I read about where he bought from RCA Gibson greeting cards. He put in a million of his own money and he made $80 million in two and a half years. I read about it and I said, that's better than practicing law. Now I didn't know what a leverage buyout was, but I knew it was better. So I tried to interest some people in Washington in starting a leverage buyout firm. I would be a lawyer for it, but nobody was that interested. And I was, I was thinking about, I, I gotta get this done. I read one other thing. I read that an entrepreneur will start his or her first um, company 
uh, as an entrepreneur between the ages of 28 and 37. And after the age of 37, your chance of starting an entrepreneurial venture goes down, just like a woman's biological chance of reproducing goes down after a certain age. Your chance of starting a company goes down after your certain age. And I read this at 37. If you haven't done it by 37, you're probably not going to do it. Well, I was 37 when I read that. So I said, uh-oh, I better do it. So I recruited three people who had financial experience. I didn't have any. I mumbled that I was going to get some money, and I had it, and so forth. And then they showed up, and I said, well, I meant to say I would get it eventually. I didn't have it. <laughs> so I then recruited, uh, I then went out and raised $5 million in 1987 to start the firm, and then we, we, we built the firm from there. So what were the big ideas that you told to the investors? Um, well, we basically said, um, you know, Everett Dirksen, who was a Senate minority leader under when uh, Lyndon Johnson was president, he famously said, if you're getting kicked out of town, get out in front and pretend you're leading a parade, all right? <laughs> so what does that mean? Take advantage of the situation you find yourself in. So I'm sitting in Washington, D.C., and I'm trying to compete against KKR and people in New York who actually had finance experience and they knew what they were doing. So I said to investors, look, we understand companies heavily affected by the federal government better than the guys in New York. And they said, that makes sense because you're in Washington. Now, I'm not sure we did, but it sounded good and it enabled us to get some money and then we would do some things. We'd buy some defense companies or other things heavily affected by the federal government. So we got started and then we built a good track record. And then we did two things that more or less changed the face of private equity, though other people at KKR might not concede this. But when KKR did the famous RJR deal in 1989, it was the biggest buyout ever done, I think over $25 million billion. I think KKR only had about seven investment professionals, a very small firm, because all these firms were mom and pop operations. They raised a fair amount of money, but they were small. And they were small because the partnership agreements forbade you to have more than one fund at a time. So KKR would have a buyout fund, but they weren't allowed under the partnership agreements to have uh, a venture fund, a growth capital fund, a mezzanine fund. I, I, so that was the same rule we had. We had a, buy, a buyout fund, but we couldn't have anything else. I decided to ignore this and basically without asking for permission, but later asking for forgiveness, I would say, I am going to raise a, uh, a second fund and a third fund and a fourth fund and build an institutional business, not unlike Fidelity had multiple funds or Vanguard had multiple funds. I would do the same in private equity. So I'd have a buyout fund for Carlisle and I would let those people run that, but I'd have a venture fund, a growth capital fund, a mezzanine fund, and build a real organization that was more than a mom and pop. And then the second idea I had was to globalize it by going to Europe and Asia and so forth and building a global organization. So we institutionalized the business, we globalized it. And obviously a lot of the other firms have now done that. When I started Carlisle, there were 250 private equity firms in the world. Today there are 6,555. There are only a limited number that are doing what we're doing. KKR, Blackstone, Carlisle, Apollo are the four biggest publicly traded ones. And they're uh, TPG, Bain, and the private, uh, not yet public, and maybe never will be public, are doing it, and they're very large as well. Interestingly, America dominates the private equity world. And you could argue this is good or bad, but uh, Americans basically are the, the, the 10 largest private equity firms in the world. They're all basically in America. So that's what we did to, 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 to kind of change the face of private equity a bit, but also we had a good track record. And you know, if you have a, a lot of great ideas, but you have a terrible track record, it's not going to get you very far. Our track record would turn out to be good, just as KKR's was very good. Where did this name Carlisle come from, by the way? Well, um, when we want to create a name, it sounds easy to say, let's get a name for something. But as any of you have started to start a business, you realize that many names are taken. So we went through the usual Greek names and Roman names, and we couldn't either pronounce them or we didn't know what they meant. So eventually, one of my partners had read a, uh, a, a book about, um, he's not at the firm now, but um, he read a, 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 not a, bi a biography of Andre Maier. Andre Maier ran Lazard Frere for many years. And Andre Maier was single, and he lived at the Carlisle Hotel, and he had a lot of uh, companionship, I guess, that, <laughs> that at the Carlisle Hotel. And, and my friend, my, my partner then, uh, aspired to have that kind of lifestyle. Be single, live in the Carlisle Hotel, a lot of companionship, and live a nice lifestyle. So he said, why don't we name it after Carlisle? And that was, we, we, our previous working name was Washington International Financial and Investment Group, which didn't exactly roll off your tongue. So we called it, and it sounded, <laughs> sounded good. Look, Carlisle is two syllables. Everybody can pronounce it. It sounded British. It means, you know, sounded classy, and, and the name was available. Though after we used it, after a while, the owner of the Carlisle Hotel said, hey, basically, you owe me a royalty uh, unless you stay at the hotel a certain number of nights a year. But anyway, uh, he, he, he dropped it after a while. But that's where the name came from. <laughs> so let's fast forward a little bit. Um, so, you know, in preparing for this, doing my diligence, I listened to some interviews you've given in the past. 
You know, it sounds as if you foresaw the collapse of leverage loan activity in 2008 and 2009, and, and maybe even took some steps right. to act on that. How, how did you see that? What was the... Well, people were paying very high prices for things at very, and, and borrowing a lot of money. Um, now, it wasn't quite as bad in the early days. In the early days of private equity, um, people, would, this is hard to believe, but people would borrow 99% um, of the purchase price and put up 1%. Now, those deals worked out okay if the economy didn't collapse. And because if the economy was growing at 4% a year, 5% a year, you're buying things from unsuspecting sellers who didn't know better in those days of four times or five times cash flow, you can sit on the beach and make a lot of money because the macroeconomic factors and the leverage will help you. Um, when KKR did the famous RJR deal, um, they used only 5% equity, 95% debt. That was fairly standard, but then it, it, you know, we drift, it drifted up to maybe 10% equity, 15% equity, 20%. Still, I, I thought in those days, probably the deals were over-leveraged a bit, people paying high prices, and I was worried about the economy you know, going down. But you know, I, I don't want to make it sound like I was that prescient. If you say something is going to fall apart, eventually people might remember you say it's going to fall apart when it actually happens. So uh, I happened to get lucky and think it was probably not going to continue forever, and, and people do remember that. But I, I, I wouldn't say I was the only person saying that. Then post-recession, uh, you predicted that a platinum age right. would replace what had been the golden age of PE. Yes. What was your reasoning for that? Well, it turns out, when people make, while people make fun of private equity, uh, because in the early days, people would um, ship jobs offshore. They weren't worried about environmental concerns. They didn't pay the, the taxes that people thought they should pay. Private equity had a bad reputation, uh, I think. Um, and, and it went through its ups and downs. But today, private equity is more or less a part of the uh, financial firmament. Most investors who have a, an array of investments will probably have some private equity investments. And that, the reason for that is this. It's not because of the charm and, and good looks of the founders of these private equity firms, I can assure you. It's really because when you go back over five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, the rates of return of private equity funds outperform every other asset class. Now, I'm just talking about the averages. If you're in the top quartile, top 25% private equity fund, you will dramatically outperform every other asset class. To make it simple, if you were to invest in public equities over the last 30 years, you would probably get an average rate of return of maybe 6%. If you were to invest in an average private equity fund over the last 30 years, you probably would get a return of maybe close to 11 or 12% on average, so maybe 600 basis points higher. So that 600 basis points is you know, the average. And if you're in, the, in a top quartile fund, you might outperform by 1,000 or 2,000 basis points. Well, people increasingly want these higher returns. When an era of low interest rates and or virtually no interest rates at bank deposits, if you can get a 15% rate of return on a private equity fund or 20%, you're going to do that. So increasingly, people are, are want to do this. Uh, take the United States pension funds, for example. Every state has pension funds. Every state has a teacher pension fund. 98% of them are underfunded, which means there's not enough money to pay the pensions. So you can solve this by three ways. One, you can uh, reduce the benefits that pensioners get. Not that popular thing to do. You can increase the taxes and contributions that people pay, not that popular, or you can say to the investment professionals, get a higher rate of return. So that's what they all choose to do. They say to the, their people running the pension funds, go out and put your money in KKR, get a higher rate of return, and we can bridge the gap that way. It, you know, the gap is still big. It can't be solved completely that way, but that's why people are, are, are putting money into private equity funds. And it's the platinum era right now because private equity is not being chased around the block, particularly by uh, government. People think we're okay. Uh, the returns have been spectacularly good for the last couple of years. People are giving us lots of money. The organizations are, are adding value and, and creating much more valuable companies. So it's been a very good age. Now, the only problem is nothing can continue forever. As Herb Stein, the former head of the Council of Economic Advisors, said, if something can't keep going on forever, it won't. And at some point, <laughs> at some point, you know, it, there'll be a slowdown. And I do worry when it will come. I don't know when it will come. It will come for reasons I can't predict. But uh, since World War II, we've had a recession on average every seven years. We've never gone more than nine and a half years without a recession. That period of time was the, the Kennedy-Johnson era, nine and a half years um, uh, or so. And, and now um, we are about nine years into a growth period. At some point, we could say we could go 10 years and break the record or 11 years, but at some point, the economy will slow down. I don't know what will cause it. Right now, there doesn't seem to be economic factors likely to cause it, but 
it could come from a, 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 a geopolitical factor we can't anticipate. You would know better than I. But something could, ha could happen that would be unanticipated today, and that could make everybody nervous, and that might slow things down. But for example, the last great recession we had, or the last recession, was caused by subprime mortgages. Nobody anticipated really that but happening, and all of a sudden it, it led to this great recession. So I don't know what it will cause it, but it will be something, and it, and it may not happen for a couple years, but at some point there'll be a slowdown. And therefore, when it slows down, all parts of the financial community will probably suffer a little bit. Private equity will be hurt a little bit as well, probably. David, we're supposed to be talking about leadership in crisis, okay. as, I, as I learned when right. Tom okay. introduced well, us tonight. But, well, I should, I should interview so you what, about that. No, 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 but yeah, you should. Um, I mean, what, what have been crisis moments for you uh, over these several decades that you've built one of the great financial well, firms? Of the um, when we first started, we were trying to do a deal. We, we, over, we, we, we almost lost it. And we've used all our money up. And if we lost this one deal, we had no money left. Um, that was not a good thing. Um, we've done some deals that didn't work out. We had some funds that didn't work out. Uh, we've had some lawsuits against us uh, that were you know, painful at times. But uh, generally, it's, it's worked out OK. Um, anybody that starts his or her own company will have ups and downs. The trick in starting a company, people ask me all the time, what does it take to be an entrepreneur? Well, it takes a lot of luck. But the, the skill sets that entrepreneurs typically have is they're reasonably intelligent, not geniuses. Geniuses are, are hard to manage, and they are complicated people. But they're nice <laughs> people in some ways. But I wouldn't necessarily, I don't like to hire geniuses, because I can't manage them. I like smart people, but not geniuses. But in general, you'll find entrepreneurs are pretty smart. They are uh, hardworking. Uh, nobody built a great company nine to five, five days a week. So you've got to really work long hours. Three, you've got to be, pers uh, you have to perseverance. The reason that most entrepreneurs start a company is not because somebody else is doing what they want to do. It's because they have an idea that nobody else is quite doing, and they want to prove that idea. Most people, to be very serious, who were in the Forbes 400 who started companies did not start these companies because they wanted to get fabulously wealthy. They wanted to prove a point. They had an idea. They wanted to make some money, I'm sure, but they didn't really want to prove themselves to be billionaires. They just want to prove this concept could work. And so you have to have perseverance. You have to be able to get along with other people. You, you know, there are no geniuses in private equity. Everything is a team, teamwork, and that's true of all entrepreneurs. And another thing I tell people that entrepreneurs should have, and all leaders should have, is the ability to uh, persuade other people. Think about this. All of life is really about persuading your partner, your spouse, your children, your parents, your business colleagues to do what you want. You can't just uh, hope, sit on an island and, and hope that things are going to happen. You've got to persuade other people to do what you want. There are three ways you do this. One is you learn how to communicate orally. You might be an effective speaker. You're obviously an effective speaker. When you say to your troops, you should do this, they're going to follow you. You have to learn how to communicate orally, and entrepreneurs who learn how to do that can, get, can inspire people to work for them. Second is you learn how to write. Not a tweet, but a learn how to write. <laughs> And the written word can really persuade a lot of people. And so if you learn how to write well, and, and many people, I'm sad to say, who graduate from college or business school or law school today are still relatively bad writers, and they, they really don't write in a persuasive way. But if you learn how to write in a persuasive way, you can get people to follow you. And the third way is the most important way. And this is what you've done, and, and, and it's this, leading by example. No, people are uh, influenced and would be persuaded to follow people who lead by example. So when George Washington was at Valley Forge, he could have stayed at a Ritz-Carlton. He didn't have to stay there. He stayed with his troops, more or less, in a tent in Ritz, uh, there, so his troops would see that he was bearing the burden with them. You did the same things. You, you did the same things with your troops in Afghanistan and Iraq. You stayed with them. They saw your example. And so when you lead people, you, you lead by example, you can persuade them to do things. I also think that entrepreneurs should be people who, um, are highly ethical, who are people that, that want to make money for the right reason, not just to pile up a lot of money, but to do something useful with it. And I also think that you have to be able to share the credit. Ronald Reagan, not somebody I've often quoted, but Ronald Reagan uh, used to say famously, there is no limit to what people can accomplish if they're willing to share the credit. And if you're willing to share the credit as an entrepreneur, you can really do an enormous amounts of uh, good things. And you've done a ton of good things, because you, of course, embarked on philanthropy in a very serious way. Uh, patriotic philanthropy, as you put it. What is that? OK, let me explain. Um, philanthropy is an ancient Greek word that means loving humanity. And I hate it when people say, these are the biggest philanthropists in the United States, because they just measure their money, uh, how much they've given away. Uh, if you help people with your ideas, your time, your energy, that can be valuable. Wendy Kopp created Teach for America. She didn't have any money, but she created something that is really a great philanthropic uh, 
endeavor, but it's not called that under the way we now look at philanthropic uh, endeavors. Uh, in my case, I realized when I was about 54, Forbes magazine wrote an article about me and my partners and saying how much money we'd made and how much our net worth was. And I realized, you know, I got a lot of money. So uh, what am I going to do with it? Well, you can do four things with it. One, you can be buried with it. You can, like the ancient pharaohs, you can build a pyramid and take your wealth and be buried with it and use it in the afterlife. But I wasn't sure that that was really necessary or was going to work. <laughs> so you eliminate that. Then what else are you going to do with your money? Well, you can uh, do what most people historically have done with their money, uh, which is spend a lot of it and spend it till they have no money left. But I had more money than I could possibly spend. So you eliminate that. I couldn't spend that. I didn't know how many houses can you have, how many planes can you have. So then you have really three other cho choices what you can do. You can give it to your children. And historically, throughout uh, organized history, most people who have money um, give it to their children. And it's only in the United States in recent years that people have been not giving it to their children but doing other things with it. So I thought that I have three children. I'm very proud of them. They're well educated. But I, don't, I thought I, would, I didn't want to burden them with giving them a billion dollars a piece. Now, they might not think that's uh, a burden. but. You know, how many people have inherited a billion dollars and gone on to win a Nobel Prize? Probably nobody. Because if you inherit too much money, you're going to lose the motivation. So, you know, if you had been given a billion dollars by your father, do you think you would be where you are today? Probably not. If I had been given a billion dollars, do you think I would be here? I would not. I'd probably be, you know, doing something useless. So I, I don't mean that you shouldn't give your kids any money, but I, I don't want to, want to give it to my kids. So then you have really two choices. You can give it away to some good cause while you're alive, or you can say, I don't know how much I need during my life, I'm going to husband it, and I'll give it away upon my death. Now, I wasn't sure upon my death I'd be in a place where I could see where it was being given by ex my executor. <laughs> so I said I would give it away during my lifetime. And as I began to think that through, Bill Gates called me and said, would you like to sign the giving pledge, which says you're going to give away half your money? And I said, well, actually, I'm going to give away all my money. And so there were 40 of us who signed it uh, initially. And um, now there are about 185 people. And now there are obviously a lot of very philanthropic people that haven't signed the pledge. But uh, this is just an indication of some, what some people are going to do with their money. And so then I did what normal people do who have lots of money and start giving away. You give it to educational institutions and, 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 and health-related things. So I've give, done that traditionally. And I, most of my money does go to education and, and medical research. But I did one little sliver of my money, went to something that I coined the phrase patriotic philanthropy. And what I, what I meant by that was, Philanthropy, which is giving back to the country in a way that reminds people of our history and our heritage. And the reason it's gotten a lot of attention is that not that many people are doing it. So if I give $100 million to a um, uh, university, it might be nice, university happy, they'll have a press conference or whatever they'll do, but lots of people are giving large sums to universities. It's not that unique. If I, as I put up, I don't know, 15 or $20 million to repair the Lincoln Memorial and have an underground education uh, part to educate people about Lincoln, that gets a lot of attention, even though it's less money, because nobody else is doing it. So it, I, I started this by happenstance. I didn't hire McKinsey and say, come up with some good ideas. What happened was this. I, went, I was in New York. I went to a, uh, uh, the view of something called the Magna Carta. And I said, how can the Magna Carta be here? It's in London, I thought. Turns out there are 17 copies of the Magna Carta, only one in private hands. It, that one in private hands was being auctioned off by, it was owned by Ross Perot. I decided that it was the inspiration for our Declaration of Independence, the inspiration for our revolution, uh, because all of our colonies had charters that said they had the rights of all Englishmen, which included the Magna Carta. So I wanted to be the one copy to be here. I bought it the next night, and I put it on display permanently at the, at the National Archives. And then I decided to buy rare copies of the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, Constitution, 13th Amendment, Emancipation Proclamation, and put them in the White House or the National Archives, Smithsonian, so people could see them. And my theory was if people would see these things, they might be inspired to learn more about American history. Right now, this is very hard to believe, but the Annenberg recently came out with a survey that showed that three quarters of Americans cannot name the three branches of government. And one quarter of Americans cannot even name one branch of government. It was also turned out recently, showed out recently that 10% of Americans think that Judge Judy is on the United States Supreme Court. It's not the case. <laughs> At least not yet. Um, so, um, I want, we don't teach civics courses anymore pretty much in junior high school. You can graduate and you can, get a, you can major in history at 80% of the colleges in the United States and not have to take an American history course as part of your history major. So I'm trying to get people to educate, learn more about it. And then the other part of it was I wanted to fix up things. When the Washington Monument had its earthquake damage, I said I'll put up the money. And then I started fixing up the Monticello or Montpelier, which is James Madison's home, or Arlington House or Iwo Jima Memorial, and sort of 
fix these things up so people can go there and have a better experience and then maybe learn more about American history, be inspired to learn more the good and the bad. So at Monticello or Montpelier, I insisted that slave quarters be built out so people know that you know, we had a birth defect in our Constitution, slavery, and that these great Americans at the beginning of our country were also slave owners and you have to you know, deal with that. And now you become a TV star. So, you know, why not golf, well, the Hamptons, anything else that the rich do? Well, and it, did your idea for that really come from being president of the economic club? Yes, Love? what happened was on golf, um, I took up golf when I was nine and quit when I was 10. And the reason <laughs> is this. My theory, and certainly as an adult, it's been my theory, if I have a conversation with you in a business setting and you think I'm a smart, intelligent guy, I would destroy the illusion of competence if I went out on a golf course with you. <laughs> so I, it also takes a lot of time. So I, I don't do that. What happened was Vernon Jordan came to me, uh, a prominent uh, lawyer, businessman uh, in Washington, and said, I'd like you to be the president of the Economic Club of Washington. Replace me. And I said, I don't even know what the Economic Club of Washington is. And I live in Washington for 30 years. What is it? He said, it's 100 business people, and you just get one speaker a quarter to come in, let them speak. Then you get questions from the audience, you read the cards from the questions, and then that's it. So I started doing that. I realized most business people are very boring speakers. People were falling asleep. And then the questions would come up, and frankly, they weren't very good. So I would make up questions, pretending <laughs> I was reading the questions. They, <laughs> you might be doing the same thing. I don't know. But so I would read them, and the people would laugh a little bit. So I said, I'm going to junk this format, and I'll do, do Q&A. So for now, about 10 years, I've been doing uh, interviews, and uh, people like it. And so some people from Bloomberg saw it and said, why don't you put it on TV? And, and I've now done that, and I've now had a couple seasons of it, and it's been enjoyable. And you are enjoying it. It's fun. I mean, I, I know most of the people I've interviewed or I know about them and I enjoy it and I have a way of doing it that works for me and you know, it, it's enjoyable. I, mean, I wish I was younger when I started this, but on the other hand, um, if, if I'd started this younger, maybe people would say I should spend more time at it, but there's no carried interest in interviewing. <laughs> and I need a carried interest to, you know, to be able to do what I want to do. So I, it's fun, but it's not, it's not going to be my day, my day job. Well, let's get to a couple of questions. You obviously travel the world. Uh, you got 31 offices on six continents, apparently. You have investors, I'm sure, on all of them, portfolio companies. How do you explain to folks overseas what's going on in Washington these days? I couldn't hear your question. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, I, I honestly, every time I go to, I, I, I'm out of the country a lot, and wherever I go, um, I, I was in Mexico this, this week, uh, Monday, making a couple speeches to universities, and everybody wants to ask about uh, what's going on in Washington, specifically President Trump. So I, you know, I try to do it up front and give my perspectives on it, and you know, it is what it is. Um, it's, it's hard for people to understand um, how some of these things can be getting done. And I'd say, you know, I, I know a little bit about President Trump. I would not say that I, I don't support candidates. I don't, I don't get involved in politics. I give no money to politicians because of the chairmanship of the Kennedy Center at Smithsonian, I want to stay out of politics. But I do know Donald Trump because I brought him down to, at the Economic Club of Washington, I brought him down to interview him. I thought he was a business person, I would bring him down and he said in the green room, David, ask me anything you want, but ask me two questions for sure. He asked me if I'm gonna run for president, I said, president of what? He said, president of the United States. I said, Donald, you have no chance, believe me. I know presidential campaigns, you have no chance. He said, well, I'll try it. And I said, what's the other question? Ask me if my hair is real and then you can feel my hair. I said, geez, I don't know if I want to feel it, but I'll, I'll ask you about it. So anyway, <laughs> we, had, we, was, we had the show, and we did the, you know, he liked it. He liked it a lot, and he called me later and said it was the highest rated show in the history of C-SPAN. It was covered on C-SPAN. <laughs> That's what he said. Um, I called the president of C-SPAN to say, what were the ratings? They said, there are no ratings, so I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, it was a good interview, and I uh, actually, I, I, when, after President Trump was elected, I did go to see him in Mar-a-Lago to say, look, I, of course, didn't think you'd win. Congratulations. You should do a better job than you've done to date of touching the symbols of our country. So go visit the um, Declaration of Independence. Go visit the original copy of the Constitution. Go visit the Supreme Court. Go to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Go to Arlington Cemetery. Go to the African American History and Culture Museum and show Americans that you understand some of the traditions of this country, the good and the bad. And, you know, I, I, I don't know if I had an impact. I, I did give him a tour of the African American History and Culture Museum with other Smithsonian officials. But, you know, anyway, I, I do know him. It's hard for me to explain everything. I, I can't completely explain it. But, you know, our democracy has been around for several hundred years and it's probably going to be around for another several hundred years. 
As you may recall, back in 1991, uh, wall comes down, Soviet Union dissolves, we win Operation Desert Storm, Francis Fukuyama, Frank Fukuyama writes that famous essay, The End of History. The Hegelian dialectic is, is over. The debate between which form of, which system is best, uh, is, right. is, it's been decided and we won. And that lasted for about 25 years. And now history is back, as you well know, the rise of China. Sure. So, and by the way, China not doing too bad. You know, the only country in history to have two decades straight of double digit GDP growth, I think with one year exception, right. um, out to compete with us, out to be the best in AI and a whole bunch of other fields. Uh, are you optimistic about the so-called liberal democratic well, systems that we Look, cherish. The United States became the biggest economy in the world in 1870, and if you measure GDP as the measure, measure wealth, we're still the biggest economy. If you measure by purchase price parity, China is already bigger than us. Um, it's very rare for a civilization or any country to dominate the world for hundreds of years, certainly in a modern age. So we've been a dominant country in the world for 120, 130, 140 years. Uh, it's inevitable that China will pass us in GDP. We have 1.4 billion, billion people. Billion people. Sure. We have uh, 320 million or 25 yeah. million. So I, I, I do think that the principles of liberal democracy and the kind of government we have and the values we have are still the ones that people around the world mostly want. But there's no doubt that Xi Jinping is leading a country that is um, admired in many ways for some of its economic uh, uh, you know, inventions and, and uh, progress. So I, I suspect over the next 25 years or so, you'll see a lot of tension and pull between the United States and, and China. Now, as you know, Graham Allison has written a book basically called Thucydides. Inter interviewed him on this stage, okay. as a matter of fact. All right, yeah. Thucydides Trap, and basically has the view that it's not impossible that we could get into some kind of military confrontation with China if history is to be believed, though, you know, who knows whether it'll happen. I think for the next uh, several decades, it'll be China and the United States vying for the world's uh, attention and favor, just as it was in the Cold War period, Russia and the United States. I think the United States has a lot of great virtues and, and uh, you know, the people, what people most admire when I go around the world about us is, I think they admire the freedom that the country you have in the country, more or less, the stability of the government, leaving aside the politics of a given president or something, but they also admire our entrepreneurial spirit they admire our uh, university system. Our, our, our system of higher education is the envy of the world, and I think our entrepreneurial spirit and our and ability to create new companies is the envy of the world as well. I do think people admire our stability of our government. Sometimes they might not like all the leaders, but I think they do admire the general democratic principles of our, our government, but we'll be, we're under challenge now for some of the things that we do, and clearly um, some of the things going on in Washington now are, are upsetting the people around the world. Questions from the audience. So you're a voracious reader, again, as we discussed right. earlier, uh, reading multiple books a week. Um, what, what two or three stand out, say, over the last year? Well, I, 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 tried to, I, I started a program to educate members of Congress about American history. Um, and actually, it's one of the, the more um, rewarding things that I've done. I, I came up with this idea, and it wasn't a brilliant idea. I said, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to get authors of American history books to come to the Library of Congress, I'll underwrite the whole thing, and I will invite members of Congress only to come. And what I would do is give them a nice reception where Democrats and Republicans, members of the House and Senate can mix with each other, and they rarely do that. And then I would give them a dinner, and they would sit with people from the opposite party, and then I would interview David McCullough, Doris Kearns Goodwin, and then members of Congress and ask questions as well. We've now been doing this for about four years. And members of Congress tell me this is the most interesting thing they're doing in Congress. Well, this is not what I intended. I, I, I hope they were <laughs> passing some legislation. But the reason they like it is because today in Washington, you can't be seen with somebody in the opposite party very much socially. And since there's no media covering this, they can sit down with people in the opposite party. And, you know, it, it's been good. And I've had a lot of uh, great authors. And I, I just did one uh, last week. It was... Um, Gordon Wood, who's a scholar from Brown University, and he wrote a new book on Jefferson and Adams and their complicated relationship. I am doing in a couple weeks Stephen Cole, who's written a book on America's and CIA's secret wars yes. in Pakistan and Afghanistan. I assume you must be a source for it, or maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but um, you, you know a lot about it. Neither so, confirm nor deny. Right. Okay. <laughs> but um, so I, I, I try to read. I, I, so those are two books that I've just uh, dealt with recently, the Adams book and, and Stephen Cole's book. And then and next week, I think I will interview um, a book, uh, interview an, uh, the man who 
uh, put together the African American History and Culture Museum, Lonnie Bunch, and he's written a book about slavery and so forth, and, uh, which is an incredible, um, uh, sad subject for American history, the, the, the real black mark on our country's history. But um, So I find members of Congress are, are really very interested in, in um, uh, American history, and, and actually they know a fair bit about it. And they're like little schoolboys in some ways. They, when I had Robert Caro, they brought their Jim Lyndon, Lyndon Johnson books up for uh, autograph. They bring, uh, when I had Doris Kearns Goodwin, they bring their books up for autograph just like anybody else. So um, it's been a good experience. Another one from the audience. Uh, how concerned are you about the wealth gap in the United States? Okay. Um, let me try to analogize it this way. Um, Everybody knows what the Big Bang is, not a TV show, but the Big Bang Theory, which is 12.7 billion years ago, uh, a little speck of dust exploded and the entire universe and the multiverse was created. Okay. Um, the theory for a number of years was that everything went this way and then it was gradually, because of gravity, going to come back to the center and that the, and that the universe was shrinking. Well, it was, it, we now know that the universe is not shrinking, it's expanding. And the same thing is true with income inequality. It was thought that if people, countries got wealthy, everybody would kind of be equal. It would, everybody would come to the center a bit. You know, if the, if the United States was very wealthy, more and more people would be in the middle class, and the middle class would kind of pull together, and you'd have people mostly in the middle class. It turns out that the expansion of, of our wealth is actually creating um, uh, greater income inequality. So today, the people in the Forbes 400 have more net worth than the people in the bottom 25% of the population. And, and it's getting worse. And the reason it's getting worse is because we have an underclass in our society, unfortunately, who are not getting educated. Um, today, 14% of all Americans are functionally illiterate. Functionally illiterate. And, and, and you can't, if you're functionally illiterate, probably get a good economic uh, system uh, going for you. And, and uh, you know, in our, our case, 85% of our juvenile delinquents are functionally illiterate. Two-thirds of our prisoners are functionally illiterate. So you have an under underclass that are never going to um, really rise up. And another related problem is this, not just income inequality, it's called social mobility. And when I was uh, at the bottom of, this, of the economic uh, ladder, um, I actually believed in the American dream, which if I worked hard, something would happen, I could get somewhere to the top. Many people in this, our underclass have given up that thought and they actually cannot rise to the top. So we are not only having greater income inequality, we're having greater social um, lack of mobility. And that's a big problem, and I wish I had a solution for it. If I had a solution for it, I'd be running for office, I would try to solve it. I don't know how to do it. It's, I think education is the only key, but it's gonna take decades to deal with the underclass. Another one from the audience. Um, if you could have dinner with anyone, living or dead, by the way, this is a question the New York Times has asked and may okay. have asked you. Well, as David well. Petraeus. Would, no, 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 no. <laughs> well, well, obviously, um, you know, Jesus Christ, I would, I would have dinner with him. I'd say, you know, is, with all these things they say about you true, and I, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but okay, but assuming you can't do a religious figure, um, you know, I'd say, uh, the, the, without doubt, the most impressive person who has been president of the United States was Abraham Lincoln. He held yep. the union together, yep. and George Washington was great and terrific, and he created the country, but it would have fallen apart without Lincoln. So I'd love to have dinner with him. I think that would be an extraordinary uh, uh, thing. Uh, of, the of the people who are living um, today, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't mind having dinner with the Pope. I think that'd be fun. I ask him, you know, uh, about his life and other things. That'd be fun. Maybe do an interview. Maybe you and I could do a joint interview of him. I don't know if he does interviews, but. Uh, you know, they're... On the 92nd Street Y stage. Here. <laughs> Ecumenical. I don't know if he'd be doing it here, but uh, maybe, maybe St. Patrick's. But anyway, um, I think uh, he would be an interesting person to have dinner with. Now, is it true that you were invited to meet with Mark Zuckerberg before he dropped out of Harvard but declined to do so? No. I mean, what were you thinking? Well, here's what happened. My son and my daughter went to Harvard. My oldest daughter was at Harvard, and she met a young man she was dating. He knew I was in the investment business. They're, they're now married and, and so forth. Um, he said, my classmate from Phillips Exeter and also my classmate from Harvard is going to drop out of Harvard. He's going to raise $10 million to start a company. I said, what's it called? Facebook. What does it do? And he described it to me. I said, look, that's a dating service. I've seen dating services, and that's what it originally was. It was really for college kids to kind of date with each other. And I said, look, let me give you some words of advice. Dating services don't work as companies. It's not going to work, and don't you know, don't spend your time trying to help him. Um, 
had I put up the initial 10 million, it'd be worth about 40 billion today. So I, I made a mistake. I did the same with Jeff Bezos. Uh, Jeff, oh. Be Jeff Bezos, uh, we own, <laughs> Jeff Bezos, uh, now the richest man in the world, he um, was starting this company to sell books online. Um, he, the problem with selling books online is you have to have a bibliography of books to sell. He didn't have that. We owned a company called Baker and Taylor, which was started in 1839 um, and had not made a profit since 1839. It was a, <laughs> not a very good company, but it, was, and it had the biggest bibliography. He came to this company and he said uh, to a salesman, I'd like to rent your bibliography and I'll give you one third of the new company I'm starting to sell books online. And our salesman said, like, we're, we're smart here. We're not taking a piece of a new company. We want some cash. So we, he agreed to $100,000 a year for five years. When I later heard about this, I said, you know, maybe that company's going to get somewhere. And I read about it, and I said, so I, maybe we didn't do such a good deal. So I flew out to see Jeff Bezos. He was in a ramshackle office. And you all may forget this, but in the early days, if you wanted to get a book from him, what you did is you, you emailed him. He would then email the publisher. The publisher would then send him the book. He would then pick it up, and then he would take it himself to the, to the uh, post office and mail it to you. It would take three or four weeks to get the book. Well, I went out there and said, you know, I think we'd like to get that third of the company because, you know, I think your company's going to get somewhere. And I think someday, Jeff, I think you're going to be worth over $100 million. He said, I'll never be worth that much. So anyway, he, he agreed that we would tear up the deal and he would give us 1% of the company, which he did. And, and at the IPO, we sold it. Um, it's today worth $5 billion. So yeah, another one of my mistakes. So a couple that you missed. I, what, I miss a lot of them. Your final question here, what was your most successful idea? Well, uh, you know, if you look back on it, um, I guess starting a company from scratch and building it is something that changed my life because it gave me the wealth to give away money. And it did the one thing that probably is the most important thing that everybody who's Jewish will recognize. And it's this. Um, when I was making my money, my mother would say, well, David, you know, that's nice, but, you know, she didn't really care that much. She wouldn't call me up and say, Carlisle just did an IPO on something, big deal. She didn't care that much. When I started giving away the money, she would call me regularly and say, David, I'm proud of you. You've done something useful with your money. You're doing something, you're giving back to society. So if you can please your mother and if she's Jewish, <laughs> nothing can be better in life than that. <laughs> and I, I would say as a final note about that, um, my mother, um, I was the only child, so if you're the only child, obviously your mother's going to be proud of you if you do almost anything. It's hard to make your mother not happy, especially if she's Jewish, so she may always want you to do more. Um, so I was, asked, I was the chairman of the board at Duke University, and I uh, was asked to give the commencement speech last year as I finished up my term. So I, and I called my mother and I said, um, this is my last time as the Duke board chairman. I'd like you to come to the commencement. And she said, who's the commencement speaker? And I said, well, I am. And she said, well, couldn't they get Oprah? And uh, <laughs> so no, they didn't, couldn't get Oprah, they got me. So it was on Mother's Day, and I was going to talk about how my mother you know, gave me the inspiration to really try to do something important in my life. She had confidence in me. And sadly, um, you know, two weeks before, she died uh, unexpectedly. And so I dedicated my uh, speech to her. And I've decided to you know, reinforce um, my commitment to give back to the country to honor my mother and my father and to say, look, I've been a very lucky guy. I, I came from nothing, and I will ultimately leave with nothing. But in, while I'm here, I want to do something to, to show that I, I appreciate what the country's done for me. So I'm very happy that I started the company because it, it enabled me to do the kind of things I'm now very happy that I'm doing. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you can now see why I was really excited to have David Rubenstein on Thank the you. stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.